Okay, may I call the meeting to order? Good evening and welcome to the Marines Memorial Club. My name is Peter Kump. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, a Vietnam veteran, and more or less a newly minted member of the Board of Directors. And before I get started this evening, I just I want to recognize a couple of uh, folks who uh, have done a lot, an awful lot for this club, one in particular. I had the good fortune of walking through the front door here, and who should I see but Mike Myatt. Can we give Mike a big hand? Come on, Mike, stand up. Where are you? It's really good to see you back, General. It's great to see you. I also would like to recognize, before I get going here, we have uh, two chairmen in, in, in this organization. Uh, one is Rick Hartnett, who is the chairman of the Marines Memorial Association. Where are you, Rick? <laughs> uh, Rick, can you see me? At your age, I'm just wondering, are you a little far back tonight? Can you, can you? <laughs> and the other one, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that, uh, but we're beginning to garner a lot of enthusiasm for an organization called the Marines Memorial Foundation. And this is a foundation that has been created as a 501c3 to raise money. Uh, it's all tax deductible, nothing has changed under the, uh, the new tax law. And our chairman of the Marines Memorial Foundation is Barry Graham. Barry, could you just be recognized? <laughs> and then finally, I suppose I had to get around to it, but I'm going to do this and say, on behalf of my good friend, Jan Hewley, President and CEO of the Marines Memorial Association and Foundation, I welcome you to our club this evening. I have a real soft place in my heart for Vietnam veterans, and it's really wonderful to see people of my generation out in the audience. Thank you so much for coming. When Jan briefed me on this event, I was humbled to learn that I would be in the company of two Army veterans who distinguished themselves as genuine heroes during our war. Phil Gioia is tonight's moderator, and Dr. Hal Kushner, who's come a long way to see us and doesn't talk about his experience in Vietnam very often, is our guest of honor. Now, you may already know who these two fellows are when you get a look at them, because both of them were featured in the well-known now um, Ken Burns documentary for the PBS network known as the Vietnam War. But let's begin with you. I want to talk about you this evening. It's all about those people, folks like you, who serve this country when others chose to take a different path. Tonight we honor your generation of servicemen and it doesn't make any difference what branch of the service you were in. We honor you and we honor the heroes that were spawned by our generation. It seems like everyone has his own take on what a hero is. Personally, I subscribe to a comment that was made by our old friend, Jim Webb, uh, on the subject of heroes. Some of you may have uh, met Jim. I have, uh, he's a really genuine guy. Um, you may remember that he was a Marine Corps platoon leader in I Corps during the Vietnam War. He later became the Secretary of the Navy and then a Senator for the state of Virginia. And that was followed up, of course, by what we all know. He was a very accomplished author. And he wrote about the war and he wrote about heroes. And uh, his word on heroes was, and I'm going to paraphrase here, uh, it was all about the young men and women who faced the issues of the war and importantly, possible death, all part of the consideration, and then weighed those concerns against their obligations to the country. While some didn't share our point of view, 
and others rationalized away or ran away, we did not shirk from our duty. We readily accepted the rough with the smooth, and Vietnam entered our lives forever. You may remember, it seems like so long ago, but it wasn't, in, in the year 2011, Tom Brokaw uh, wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. I think that the phrase had been used before, but Brokaw wrote the book in 2011, and I was thinking about our generation, and I was thinking to myself, he may have written about The Greatest Generation, but we knew him long before that guy ever wrote those bo that book. And we knew them, we knew them because they were the guys who came home from the Second World War. They were our dads, they were our neighbors, and I was thinking about a guy by the name of Frank Jersich at, on Roseville Way where I grew up. They were even the guy who drove the ice cream truck <laughs> down the street where I lived. But all these guys came home, and I couldn't help but think about them and what they did, although I was a very young kid. And although I didn't know it then, my own Vietnam journey is rooted in those days and those people. I was born a little less than a year after Pearl Harbor. My dad was based right across the bay at Alameda Naval Air Station. And I jo joined humanity along with the many of you, the rest of you, I'd almost say, as what became known as war babies. And um, we became uh, the, um, the, the root of the Vietnam generation. And before I go any further, I'm going to ask, is there anybody in the audience tonight who served in the Second World War? OK, I'm, not you, Mackenzie. <laughs> no, uh, Korea. Any, oh, good, a Korea vet. Any, I'm not done. Lebanon, Lebanon, stand up. No, don't be bashful. I see that hand going up down there. Come on, you guys, you guys are important to all of us. Sudan, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. These two guys are too bashful or shy to stand up and be recognized, but I see them and I know them as heroes. And I ask you all, from World War II all the way through, give them a hand. <laughs> you know, in 1964, if you were a kid, Vietnam was little more than a rumor. For all we knew, the Gulf of Tonkin and the USS Maddox <clears throat> were nothing more than props in the very well-known Broadway hit South Pacific. We didn't know much at that time. Not many of us thought beyond our girlfriends, cool cars, cruising Mel's drive-in, and waiting for school to end for the summer. Then, like the fog creeping through the Golden Gate, rumor gradually became reality. That's when America's avuncular newscaster, our old friend Walter Cronkite, said that the, the country was slipping into a nasty Asian war. And I remember quite distinctly, and I think uh, looking at the audience, you probably do too, he signed off every night with, and that's the way it is was the way, I couldn't say it nearly as well as he did, but that's what the way he used to sign off. And I got to thinking to myself, as the days slipped by, it became very, very apparent to me that Walter Cronkite knew a hell of a lot more about what was going on than I did. And uh, all of a sudden, the summer of 1965 is upon us, and I had just graduated from college and I needed a job. So through the good offices of Pete McGilligot's dad, I started marking time as a janitor for the San Francisco Unified School District. <laughs> so my, my father had a comments about the value of my college education, I'll tell you that. Not, not as an insult to anybody, but he had a few things to say. Pete, uh, Pete, whose father got me the job, 
was my roommate. And we were really, really tight. He was a Marine reservist and a rookie cop right here in San Francisco. In 1965, Pete was a walking advertisement for the Marines. Someone I admired and respected. So as the country ramped up for war, I began to think seriously about following him into the Corps. Tragically, uh, we lost Pete. He was killed in doing his duty as a cop right out in Golden Gate Park as he tried to prevent a robbery. And he and his partner got into a shooting uh, shootout with uh, two criminals and he was killed. The significance of that was it taught me about losing somebody who I really loved. And um, you know what? He was my first real life hero. And little did I know that there would be many more uh, before my time was over. I didn't have the wit or the inclination to jockey for a deferment and who had no desire to learn the words to O Canada. So, somebody give me the first verse I could try. <laughs> so it was at that point, prodded by the prospect of an early draft, that I entered the federal building, the home of each service's band of merry men who we knew as recruiters. And I went down there and it was all over in a heartbeat. And this picture tells why. The Marine Corps has a uniform known as Blue Service Delta. And with all due respect to you sailors and soldiers and airmen who are out there in the audience, it is a powerful recruiting tool. <laughs> it really, I mean, it, it proved to be true. Do you remember the movie Jerry Maguire when Zellweger says to Cruz, you had me at hello? I'll give you one guess where this story's going. <laughs> well, that line pretty much applies to my first look at Blue Service Delta. Growing up, I wasn't much of a fisherman, but I knew I could catch trout if I had a dazzling multicolored lure. I think you know where this is going. <laughs> Blue Service Delta was going to hook me, and there wasn't a darn thing I could do about it. I mean, think about it. Blue trousers trimmed in red. See them up there? Blue trousers trimmed in red. I took the hook, I took the line, and I grabbed the sinker. <laughs> Khaki blouse, tight in the waist, broad in the shoulders. I was in the net. White barracks cover. God, I was flopping around on the bottom of the boat. It was all over in a heartbeat, and then the whole thing moved to warp speed. Silver wings from San Francisco International to DCA. Yellow footprints at Quantico. Marine Corps Green, my new best friend. Gold, holy smokes, I'm a butter bar lieutenant, and I still don't know anything. Blue and gray. I joined 3rd Battalion, 26th Marines, and, uh, 26th Marines and the Fleet Marine Force Pacific. I ship out to Vietnam on the USS Bell Grove. Hello, Da Nang. Jade jungle, dust, dirt, and mud. I go to war. We go to war. It's hot. It's wet. It's dangerous. And it's perversely seductive. Earlier, I mentioned accepting the rough and the smooth. Branch of service didn't matter. It didn't matter if you were an airman or a sailor or a soldier. We all fought hard. We all knew what we were doing. But I can't help but tell you, the rough and the smooth were always with us during that war. There was no escaping it. And in my case, it didn't get any rougher than losing my platoon net than losing my platoon mates, Buck Egan and Bobby Nail, in combat. They are as young and alive for me today as they were on the day they died. I do honor them so and hope to see them on the other side. Thank you, thank you.
the smooth comes a lot easier. My days in the Marine Corps are indelible. Many have written that the Corps changed them forever, matured them, taught them responsibility, gave them direction, the benefits of teamwork, and introduced us to the value of camaraderie, that mutual trust and friendship that our Corps deems so important. So many lifetime lessons to hang on to. It's been 50 years since I packed my Blue Service Delta into my sea bag for the last time. As the years passed, the Corps and its lessons were never far away. And as I made my way in the civilian world, the Corps was there, excepting one or two occasions, to remind me to stay humble when I was up and undaunted when I was down. Now on to the heart of our program. It is my privilege this evening to introduce our moderator, two-time Silver Star winner, two-time Purple Heart winner, tour, two-tour veteran. You were lucky with the twos, weren't you, Phil? <laughs> two-time tour veteran of the Vietnam War. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Mr. Phil Gioia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, you know, it's interesting about preparation. I had some remarks made, and then I see that they're printed in your program, so we'll skip that. <laughs> but what I'd like to do, because Hal and I both served in the same unit in Vietnam, the 1st Cavalry Division, is tell you a little bit about that division and then tell you a little bit about Hal and his experience. Um, the 1st Cavalry Division was not a cavalry outfit. It was an infantry division, light infantry. Uh, and the units in that division were known as rucksack outfits. It, it had been the cavalry division up until 1942, and then it fought in the Pacific in Korea, brought back to Fort Benning, reorganized as an air mobile division to fight the brush fire wars of the Vietnam era. Uh, President Johnson deployed it to Vietnam, and it had 450 organic helicopters of various sizes, which enabled it to lift its nine infantry battalions and deploy them up and down the country. Um, and I want to say for just a moment that I'm very uncomfortable with the term hero because all I did was I was a platoon leader and company commander like thousands of others that did that job in the Marines and in the Army in Vietnam and to them we owe a great debt, a great debt. All of them stuck their necks out, went to the field and risked the same way that, that I did and my fellows in the 1st Cav. Hal was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 9th Cavalry. Every division has a reconnaissance unit. The battalion that really did the air scouts and reconnaissance in the 1st Cavalry was not an infantry unit. It was an air mobile scout cavalry unit. It had four companies of helicopters and four platoons of infantry, known as blues. There was a blue platoon in each of the companies. And they would land those infantrymen, and those infantrymen would look for contact. And when they got in the contact, then we would pile on with a regular battalion and regular companies by air. And Hal was um, assigned to the 1st of the 9th, and his experience, I think, is a demonstration of the capriciousness and arbitrariness of war. You think about the fact that he was a doctor. He was a flight surgeon. And in Vietnam, most doctors were never forward of, a, a, at the very least, a fire base. And, and most of them were back in base areas at the surge hospitals and the, and the other types of hospitals. Now, here's a, here's a qualified flight surgeon on an ordinary mission, in an aircraft piloted by professional pilots. First Cav had great aviators. And because of an accident, he was the sole survivor of that crash. The only man who survived that crash, and then he was shot while he was being captured by the enemy. The enemy didn't have to shoot him, they did that, and they did it anyway. And his experience is a very unique experience. He went through five years of captivity. I cannot fathom what that took. But we've gotten to know each other by email because of both of us appearing in that documentary that was released earlier this year. And I have to tell you that Hal Kushner is a very unusual combat veteran. He is very self-effacing. He is very balanced. He, re he came back on, onto uh, the medical profession and he travels the world operating pro bono in the summers on children, on their eyes. He's an ophthalmic surgeon. 
I think it's a great honor to know him, and I think we're very honored to have him here with us tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, Hal Kushner. Phil, would you give me a bottle of sure. water? And just yes, sir. Case, <laughs> just in case. Right. Prefer that it was vodka. Thank you. Mr. Kump, uh, I know what it's like to follow Barry Bonds at bat now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And one of the best things about the documentary that uh, Phil and I were in is that I got to meet Phil. We shook hands for the first time last night. I had never met him till yesterday, but we had a very lively email correspondence for the better part of a year. And regardless of what he says, two silver stars, two purple hearts, he airborne ranger, he is a true American hero. And <laughs> and best of all, he's a Virginia boy like me. <laughs> uh, I am flattered and honored to be invited to such a prestigious venue. I saw uh, in your magazine that you had my good friend Bill Reeder here in December. Bill and I were next door neighbors in Hanoi. I know his story very, very well. In fact, I participated in it. And I am in room 406 in this beautiful hotel and my room, the walls are covered with portraits of very famous people who have spoken here at this venue. And just a glance at it, makes me very nervous. <laughs> so instead of speaking, I thought that I would just sing a medley of my favorite songs. <laughs> I am not famous. I'm just a small town doctor. And before that, I was a military physician. I'm a veteran. There are 22 million veterans. And we pledged our lives to defend our country. And the first sentence, the very first in the Code of Conduct is, I am, Amer I am an American fighting in the forces which guard our country and its way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Nothing could be a more clear declarative statement than that. I was a POW in Vietnam. I have the dubious distinction of being the only American physician captured in that very long war. I was held for five and a half years against my will, 1,932 days under really unspeakable conditions, and half of the men in my camp died. They died. And those words, I am prepared to give my life in their defense, were often in my mind. My son, Michael, was 50 years old on April the 8th, just last month. He was born four months after I was captured. I never knew he was born. I never knew he was a boy. I never knew he was healthy until just a month or two before I came home, and I never met him until two days before his fifth birthday. My daughter, Tony Jean, who is now 54, was barely potty trained when I left. And when I came back to her, she was nine and a half in the fifth grade and this tall. Before I was captured, I was deployed with a famous air mobile unit, which Phil mentioned, first of the night, 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry. We were involved in daily combat. I replaced Captain Carl Chenep of Memphis, Tennessee, who was killed in action in April of 1967. Ours was the unit featured in that 1979 film, Apocalypse Now. And my CO, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Nevins, who was my dear friend, was the man after whom the Robert Duval character, Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore, was modeled. Colonel Nevins never said, oh, how I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> but he certainly did fly his helicopter around wearing a black Stetson and not a flight helmet. <laughs> and he certainly did fly his helicopter in combat drinking coffee out of a first cab mug. He certainly did that. Each day, my medics would go out on operations on helicopters with infantry troopers, which as Phil told you, we call blues. The medics wore standard helmets without red crosses. 
and they carried sidearms and M16s to defend themselves and their wounded. Our choppers went out on daily operations and they returned with killed and wounded GIs. We treated and stabilized the wounded GIs and if their wounds were serious enough, we evacuated them to a more advanced facility. Sometimes they would bring back enemy POWs and we treated and evacuated them right beside Americans. We had troops in the first of the night spread over 350 miles of Vietnam, all the way from Phan Thiet in the south to Chu Lai in the north. And I had a permanent aid station, Quonset Hut, in our rear area, on K, that was named after Captain Chenep, who had been killed. In our forward area, we had two LZs, two bits and dog, and I had a, an aid station, which was a sandbag tent at LZ two bits. And life on the LZ was basic. We usually ate sea rations. My favorite was the fruit cocktail. <laughs> and the cases of C's had those little cigarette packs, remember, with four cigarettes in them, and those little baby rolls of toilet paper. <laughs> and we had immersion heaters and 55-gallon drums to burn our excrement. Part of my job was hygiene. And guess what we call those? I thought we had it pretty rough, and then I got captured. 30 November 1967, in a driving rainstorm, about 2,100 hours, our UH-1 Delta went down in Indian country, enemy territory. The accident was later deemed non-survivable. The pilot was killed on impact. The co-pilot was seriously injured. He went through, still in his seat, his seat failed, he went through the chin bubble of the Huey helicopter and the, the bones of his right lower leg, the tibia and fibula, were sticking through the nylon of his jungle boot. The crew chief was knocked unconscious, but thrown clear. I woke up in a burning helicopter. I unbuckled my seat belt and I nearly broke my neck because my helmet was plugged into Camo and the helicopter was completely inverted. It was upside down and I had no, I was completely disoriented. I tried to free the pilot. I took his knife and tried to cut his seat belt. He was crushed up against the instrument panel and I'm sure he was dead. And the chopper was burning and I, I jumped off of it. And when I jumped off the chopper, I could see by the light of the fire the other crew on the ground. And then the helicopter just went up in a big whoosh, just like that. It, only at that time did I realize that my left collarbone was broken and the two bones in my forearm, left forearm, were fractured. I had no glasses, and I'd lost a bunch of teeth. It turned out to be seven. And I had burns on my legs and back. The M60 and the chopper cooked off a bunch of rounds, and some of them hit me in the back and left shoulder. So we took stock. We had a severely wounded warrant officer, a moderately wounded flight surgeon, an unharmed crew chief, we had no supplies, two 38 pistols and 12 rounds of ammunition, and a knife. We, the flares, the first aid kit, all the survival gear had burned up in the helicopter. That night I splinted the co-pilot's leg with tree branches and an army belt. And I strapped my left arm to my body, there's an orthopedist out here, in a modified Velpo dressing because of my collarbone. And we made a lean-to with the door of the helicopter. It was pouring rain, and the three of us huddled under that door all night long. The next morning at first light, we sent the crew chief for help. We thought we knew where we were. We thought we were very close to Friendly's, about 10 miles west of Friendly's. He never came back. Later, actually six years later, when I came back, I was informed that he was found dead, shot dead, and submerged in a rice paddy just very close to the crash site. The rule is you stay with the aircraft, and that's what we did for three long rainy days and nights. The weather never cleared. The poor co-pilot was very brave and in a great deal of pain. We had nothing to eat but rainwater, and on the morning of the third day, 2 December 1967, this brave young warrant officer just slipped away. When he died, I decided to leave the aircraft and go for help. I took the compass from the burned out aircraft and I thought we were west of Friendly's, so I moved east, I thought, 
couldn't see the sun. I went down the mountain and I went as close to 090 as I could. I went down a riverbed because the foliage was so thick I couldn't make my way through that. And I fell once and I cracked some ribs falling on, in the riverbed. When I got to the bottom of the mountain, the sun came out and I could see that I had gone the wrong way. I had actually gone west and the, the compass was broken. And I saw helicopters hovering over the crash site. They actually found the crash site the next day and they saw that the co-pilot's leg was, quote, professionally splinted and they assumed that I was alive and not critically injured. And that became a big deal. I walked about a mile down the path and I saw a man working in a rice paddy and he saw me first and he, I had a captain's bar, captain rank and uh, caduceus on my fatigues and he said, Dai Wee Bok Si, Dai Wee Bok Si, which means Captain Doctor. And he took me a short ways down a path to a hooch and he sat me down outside the hooch and he went in and came out with a can of sweetened condensed milk, a sea ration can opener and a sea ration spoon. And I opened it and I uh, was eating the, this stuff, it was like pudding, and very shortly, within seconds, a squad of 14 VC came upon me and the squad leader said, surrender, no kill in English, surrender, no kill. And he made a motion like raising his arms and I raised my right arm and my left arm was strapped to my body with the belt still and he shot me right through the, sh he shot me through the trapezius where the neck and shoulder come together right here. It went right through me. And I think he was more nervous than I was. Uh, they took me. They took my dog tags and they took a medallion I had that my father had given me with a St. Christopher's on one side and a Star of David on the other. And they took my wallet and my ID card and I showed them my Geneva Convention card, right with, white with a red cross, which identified me as a medical personnel. And the guy tore it up and he said, no POW, criminal, criminal, in English. And then I was to find out what rough meant. For the next five and a half years, 64 months, 1,932 days, I really learned what rough meant. They took my boots and they tied me tightly with combo wire in a duck wing position like this, tied my elbows, and they marched me to a cave until nightfall. And then they tied me on a door and a young man beat me with a bamboo stick. And then we stayed during the day in hiding places and we marched mostly at night for about 30 days. I was tightly bound and we walked on rice paddy dikes and my guards, I had two or three guards, they would strike these little homemade lighters and by the sparks of the lighters, they could see how to walk a few steps. And I couldn't see a thing. I didn't have glasses and I, it was pitch black and I would fall off the dikes, which are maybe 18 inches wide into the rice paddy and they would pull me up by my bonds and my feet were lacerated and it was, it was, it was rough. I got to the point, I was sick and I was fever. My, my wound w had, was full of maggots and I just didn't care. Artillery would come in and they would take cover, die for cover, and I just stayed upright. I really just didn't care. After about seven or eight days, we crossed a clearing and I will never forget there were tiger cages and there were Vietnamese men, women, and children in these cages. I thought it must be some type of political prison. I never found out, it was never mentioned. And then a day or two later we came to another clearing and there were wounded Vietnamese and there were in hammocks and there were people walking around with homemade crutches, <clears throat> excuse me. And I assumed it was a field hospital. And this female came out and she had me lie down supine on my back on a log that had been cut in two sliced in two, and she gave me a bamboo stick to bite on and she heated up an AK-47 uh, cleaning rod in a fire, and then she went right through my wound, back and forth, and it really, it, it hurt, it hurt like hell. 
And she gave me, um, she put mercurochrome on the wound, and then she gave me uh, one aspirin tablet. And I thought, what else can they do to me? <clears throat> and I was, I was to find out. Along the way, there was one thing I want to tell you about. We stopped to rest in the daytime, and this old man came up to me, and he took off my, tried to take my, my fatigue jacket, and I was holding it. I thought I didn't have a shirt, and I thought he was trying to take it for a souvenir, and the guards made me give it to him. And he actually took it to a stream, and he washed it, and he dried it over a charcoal fire, and then he gave it back to me. And <clears throat> he took a cigarette, and he burned all the leeches off my legs. My pants were like half burned off. And I thought this was a, an oasis of kindness in a, in a sea of, of, in a desert of cruelty. And I think about it now and I get emotional. Uh, that was a, a very nice thing that guy did. I think about that often. <clears throat> a few days later, they put me in a dark hut with no light, and there was a small oriental man in the hut, and he did not speak Vietnamese. He spoke a Asia, an Asian language, which I don't know what it was. He was emaciated, and he looked like he had cancer or tuberculosis, and he coughed all the time. And they left me in there for two days, and then a, they took me out, and there was a Vietnamese English-speaking officer, the first real English speaker. And he had one of these little tape recorders that was in a leather case around his neck. It was a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, battery-powered recorder, and he said I could make a message to my family if I would agree to condemn the war. And he gave me a tea and a cigarette, and I, I said that I would rather die than make a statement against my country. And <clears throat> he said words to me that were the most profound prophetic words I had ever heard. He said, you will find that dying is very easy. Living, living will be the difficult thing. And then he went away. There was no more pressure. He just went away. The next morning, we left in a driving rainstorm, and we went higher and higher in the mountains. I was very weak. I asked to stop off, and they used ropes, too. We had to traverse some difficult places. And finally, two days later, after 30 or 31 days of this marching, we came upon the first American camp, and I was shocked. I, I saw four of the saddest-looking Americans I had ever seen in my life. They were wearing filthy black pajamas. They had no shoes. They had matted hair and beards, and they had rotten teeth. And I thought I had expected Stalag 17. I had expected searchlights and guard dogs and guard towers and a Red Cross packages and a hospital I could work in. And what I found was just a bunch of hooches at the top of a mountain in, in, a, muddy, in a muddy area with a stream running by it. And they told me that there was an American officer who had died four months before, a special forces officer. And although we moved camp very frequently, it was always with, within one or two days' march, 20 or 30 miles. And that was, the, that was my home for three and a half years. That was my home. And I found out later it was called the Bravo One Front in the Military Region 5 by the NVA, B1 Front. Uh, it was triple canopy jungle. We were, we were fed three coffee cups of rice per day that we cooked. And it wasn't Uncle Ben's white rice. It was this rice that had been cached since the days of the Viet Minh in the 50s. And it was shot full of rat feces and stones and weevils, lots of weevils. And in the rainy season, the ration was cut to two coffee cups. They gave it out to us and we had this stuff they called nook mom. People who served in Vietnam know what it is. It's a rotted fish sauce. We got a, a certain volume of that per month, and we put it on our rice. It was very small. And so for two years, we had no shoes, no clothes, no blankets, no medicine, no tobacco, no nothing. And it was cold. We were up at like 5,000 feet altitude, and half of us died. Ten Americans died. 
They captured three, they captured five West German nurses who worked for the Knights of Malta, which was a neutral organization. I'm sure they were mistakenly captured. They died, three of them died within two months in our camp. So 13 deaths, 10 of whom died in my arms while I was holding their head. One was executed after recapture in an abortive estate, escape attempt. He was simply murdered. They recaptured him, walked up to him, and shot him through the head. And one was beaten near to death and died shortly thereafter. And when a man died, we rolled him in bamboo. We dug their graves. I eulogized them. We covered their graves. We marked their graves with stones and with bamboo sometimes. And I can report to you that every single one of them has been repatriated thanks to JPAC, the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command. And the last one, Lance Corporal Dennis Hammond, who died in 1970, his remains were repa repatriated in 2004, 34 years later. And now they lie in the shadow of their families, in the soil of their country, where, where they belong. We were subject to intense indoctrination in the jungle. They built a classroom right out of the jungle, and they promised us release if we, quote, made progress. And they had a big sign saying, freedom of speech is necessary in the debate. But once when I said that Ho Chi Minh was a puppet of Mao Zedong, they dragged me out of the classroom and tied me up and beat me um, severely. Then after this class was over, this high-level Viet Vietnamese cadre offered me higher rations if I would work in a Vietnamese hospital. And he told me that American doctors had done that in Germany during when they were, a lot of doctors were captured in the bulge. And he said they had worked in German hospitals. I didn't believe him and I refused and I'm, I'm glad I did and I stayed with my own men and I took my chances. <clears throat> Our captors tried to separate us by race and indoctrinate us differently. We had five black soldiers. They gave up on that quickly. They put us in different hooches, and they uh, gave us different indoctrinations. And within two months, they gave up on that. We were all to Americans, and we all stayed together. Um, <clears throat> we slept on one large bamboo pallet, a bed, we called it. And we had from five to 20 men on it, depending on how many men were captured at that time. We were sick. We had malaria, we had dysentery, we had jungle diseases, and men vomited and defecated on the pallet, and we were nursed and cleaned by our fellows. We took care of each other. On holidays like July the 4th, we sang patriotic songs very quietly, so our captors could not hear us. We had one book, it was a Catholic Missal, issued by the United States Marine Corps that one man had when he was captured, fit in the blouse pocket of his utilities. And the Vietnamese tore out the first two pages. The first page, <coughs> excuse me, had a picture of the American flag. The second page had the first stanza of the Star Spangled Banner. So we had this one book, and that was it. We did slave labor, we dug bomb shelters, we carried elephant grass, we cut wood, and we carried rice. There are lots of stories, I, mean, I have a lot of stories. And in the fall of 1968, five men died within two months, and I, I just thought I was going insane. All we needed was nutrition and fluids and some vitamins. Our camp was a muddy morass covered with piles of human excrement because we were just too sick to make it to the latrine, which was behind it. And so we were starving to death, and we decided to eat the camp commander's cat. And the camp came down, the cat came down there, and we killed it. And we were boiling the cat about three o'clock in the morning. And we were forbidden to have a fire, except when we cooked the rice. And so a guard came down, and we told him that we had killed a weasel. Guards had chickens, we didn't have chickens, and they were always having trouble with weasels. We said we threw a rock at it, but the guard, who was a 
Mountain Yard, he saw one paw of the cat. Somebody neglected to bury it. We buried the head and the three paws. Things got very serious. They mustered the guards. The cadre came down with sidearms strapped on. The guards had rifles. They lined us all up and said, who did it? After a few minutes of browbeating, one guy said that he did it. They pulled him out, kicked him to the ground, beat him and kicked him unmercifully. Then they pulled me out, tied my hands behind my back, beat me in the face with fists, tied me very tightly with commo wire, and hung me from a beam of a hooch with the carcass of the cat around my neck, and kept me there for a day, and then tied me to a tree. And I was so crazy, I thought they were going to make me eat the cat, and I thought that would be a good thing. Uh, but uh, I buried the cat. The fellow that was beaten so badly died two weeks later. And I was actually holding his head in my arms, and he was in coma. And he woke up, and he focused his eyes, and he looked right at me. And he said, Mom, Dad, Sis, I love you very much. Box 10, Doverly, Louisiana. And when I was released, when I had convalescent leave, I went to Doverly, Louisiana. <clears throat> and I spoke to his father. I went to see four of the 10 people who died, four of the families of the 10 people who died. I called the others on the phone. They were all very grateful and very gracious that I had called them or visited them, except for one lady in Danville, Illinois. She did not want to talk to me about it, and I understood that perfectly well. Uh, there was an uplifting moment while I was captured. I hope I'm not taking too much time, but I, I wanted to tell you this. Tet of 1970, the Vietnamese slaughtered a water buffalo. And when they did that, when they had a celebration, they would give us the parts they didn't want, the eyes, the lips, uh, pieces of skin with hair on it, stuff like that. In this particular time, they invited mountain yards, and we had these mountain yards living around there, and they were very primitive. They wore loin claws and had spears and crossbows. And they brought a guy, the mountain yards brought a guy that was afflicted. He had cerebral palsy, he was mentally retarded. They shunned him, the Vietnamese shunned him, and he came down to our camp. And this particular time, this one time, the Vietnamese, besides giving us the pieces of water buffalo, had given us about 30 pieces of peppermint candy, individually wrapped. And we never had sugar, we were starving. We had not had sugar in years. And I don't know whose idea it was. Somebody decided, let's show this guy what Americans are like. And we, we divvied the candy up like dealing cards. And we put him in. And we, gave, it was, we had about 30 pieces, so he got two. Everybody got two. I have never been more proud of being an American, ever. Because we had nothing, and we shared it with a guy in bad shape. So by February of 1971, there were 12 of us left out of 27. And the Vietnamese were talking about moving us north because they wanted some bargaining chips. And then one day, helicopters flew very close to the camp, American helicopters. And they put us all in a bond shelter and threatened to shoot us if we tried to signal them. Then three days later, and Phil and I were talking about this last night, we were in an arc light. B-52s, and I mean, it was the most terrifying, frightening thing I have ever been in in my life. Trees uprooted, shrapnel as big as a man flying through the air, concussive force so great that you knocked unconscious and you wake up and your ears are bleeding and your nose is bleeding, and it was absolutely terrifying. And then they decided they would move us north. So we were divided into two groups, the 12 of us, six and six, fast and slow. I was in the fast group. We walked 900 kilometers. It took 57 days. It got easier because we carried our own rice. They gave us these little rucksacks. We carried our own rice and we cooked it every night. And I got stronger. And we came out of the mountains. It wasn't a difficult walk. And when we walked on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, about every 10 to 15 miles, there's a way station where caves are dug out and you go in and you can hang your hammock. They gave us hammocks made of American parachute silk. And uh, it, 57 days, 
Along the way, I stole a uniform from a clothesline. I had one pair of black pajamas, which we washed out. But along the way, I saw this khaki uniform, NVA uniform with no rank on it, just pants and shirt, and I stole it, and I put it in my rucksack. And we walked to Venn, which is a railroad terminus, 180 miles from Hanoi. When we got there, we had to crawl across the DMZ, and that was pretty hairy because there was bombing artillery coming in. Right, It was a very active area. We went across at night. Most of the walk, we were shackled. And when we slept at night, they shackled our legs and arms with iron manacles. So anyway, I stole this uniform, and uh, they put us on a train in Venn, and they had captured uh, hundreds of Arvin prisoners in this operation called Lam Son 719er, you remember that, incursion into Laos. They captured hundreds of Arvins. They put a cram crammed us in a boxcar. It took 18 hours to go to Hanoi. I folded this uniform up in my rucksack and I slept on it. And when we got to Hanoi, I put the uniform on. It was creased. I wanted to have dignity. When I got off that train, I wanted to not be defeated. I wanted to have some dignity. So they picked us up and they put us in a big Jeep-like thing and they took us to a prison in Hanoi. It was called the Plantation. Mostly Southern prisoners were in there. And I felt like I had looked dignified when I came out. Uh, I was placed in a cell with the people that I traveled with the men that I'd been with in the South, and we were very, I was sick, I had malaria. They weighed me when I got up there, the only time they weighed me. I weighed 48 kilos, 105 pounds. That was the only time I weighed. I was sick with malaria, I hardly remember that area at that time, and after two or three months, they moved me into another cell with officers and warrant officers. There were six of us in a cell, and it was a single light bulb in the cell. We had a bucket that was a latrine, we slept on pallets. When it was in the summertime, we roasted. It was like a sauna. In the wintertime, it was dank and cold and damp. We had a single light bulb. We had a speaker, and they played propaganda over the speaker and American music. And when Americans came to Vietnam, like Jane Fonda or Pete Seeger or Ramsey Clark, they would speak to us over those loudspeakers. One man got out once a day to empty the latrine bucket, and he, there was a cesspit about 50 yards away, and he walked and emptied it. We actually passed notes to each other. We were forbidden from talking to other rooms, and we passed notes through the, uh, through the bucket. We had uh, nothing to read. Nobody got any letters or packages at all. We were fed twice a day, pumpkin soup, a little bowl of pumpkin soup, a little piece of French bread, no rice, two cups of hot water twice a day. So there were four cups of hot water. We got out twice a week for 30 minutes to wash in a well, and then we were put back in. And that was, that was it. No one died. It was a cruel jail, but no one died. Each day in the South was a grim struggle for survival. The North was not like that. <clears throat> in December of 1972, we heard B-52s and bombing really close by, really close by, but we began to cheer. Something was happening. Operation Linebacker 2. The camp commander came down the next day and he gave us a pick and shovel. He said, I can no longer guarantee your safety, which was rich since half the people in my camp had already died. But he said, you can dig a bomb shelter in your room. We had a cement floor. And the six of us, it was hard work. The six of us divided it up and we dug a bomb shelter, picked through the cement. We put the pallets on top of the hole. And when they came the next night, the B-52s, we got in the hole with the pallets on top of us. And we were cheering. And on January 27th, just a few days after Linebacker 2 ended, they signed the peace treaty. Right before they signed the peace treaty, they moved us to the Hanoi Hilton. And they came and shackled us with iron manacles and blindfolded us and put us in a truck. But they manacled our wrists in front of us and I could reach over and just pull my blindfold down and rode around for four hours in the truck and the Hanoi Hilton was about six blocks away. And 
Then they let us off. And at that point, they opened the camp. Rations increased. We got canned sardines. We got canned tuna fish. We got much better food. And they let us talk to each other. They put a basketball goal up in the camp yard, volleyball goal. And the, the, this was the peace had been signed. A month later, in late February, I got my only Red Cross package, men and skin bracer, a ballpoint pen, a tablet, a book called The Great Rehearsal by Carl Van Doren about the writing of the American Constitution. And I got a letter from my mother. And she didn't mention my son. I later found out she had written me a thousand letters and told me a thousand times about him, but this particular one didn't mention it. And that may be why they gave it to me. But my, my comrades and I are convinced that Operation Linebacker 2 brought us home. So we were released in groups. I was in the fourth group, 16 March, 1973. 16 March, 1973. Uh, I was taken with a group of about 50 POWs to Jai Lam Airport. We were kept in a shed. I want to tell you this, our senior ranking officer was Colonel Ted Guy, USAF. He was, he was a, a, a real military person. We never saw him. He got tortured and beaten to death because he tried to be the ranking officer in our camp. And through uh, methods, he got word to us. And they continually beat him and tortured him. But he told us, he got us in the shed, and he told us, we, they had given us this little uniform to go home in, a windbreaker, a pair of pants, cardboard shoes, and a little shirt. He, this is after five, he was captured the same time I was, after five and a half years of capture. He said, I want every man to zip down his windbreaker one third of the way. I want you to carry your AWOL bag in your left hand. They'd given us a little AWOL bag. And he said, when you march out, I want you to look like soldiers. Well, we didn't march out. They called us individually. But that made a big impression on me. Indomitable will. And they called my name. I walked out into bright sunlight from the shed. First thing I see is this beautiful C-141 star lifter, red and, I mean, white and gray. And it had a red cross on it. And it had our flag, our flag on the tail section. And it was the most, I was emotionally overwhelmed. I had not seen our flag in over five years. USAF on the fuselage. And I was greeted by this burly Brigadier General, Class A uniform, Air Force. And he, he just, he looked, he had meat on him. He had thickness, he had breadth. And I saluted him because, after all, this was a simple military courtesy that had been denied us for five years. He saluted me back, we shook hands, and he actually hugged me to him. He said, welcome home, Major Kushner. I'd been promoted. I didn't even know I'd been promoted. <laughs> and he said, we're glad to see you, doctor. And there were tears on his face. And so I came home. We went to the Philippines. And I was there for two or three days in uh, medical and administrative stuff. I got some false teeth. I had missed seven teeth. They made me temporary teeth. Got some glasses. They fitted us for uniforms. Got to call home. Uh, it, it was three days. And then we went to Hickam. We flew in the same C-141, went to Hickam. And we got to Hickam about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I had promised that when I was captured, if I ever made it home again, I was going to sing America the Beautiful, the minute I landed on American soil. <clears throat> so we landed about 2 o'clock in the morning. There were 1,500 people out to greet us at Hickam. And they had microphones set up, and they all came up, and they put lays around our neck and everything. And we, had, we were in uniform, and there were reporters in this group. And I told them that I had vowed to sing America the Beautiful, so I sang it. And everybody joined in, even the reporters. In those days, they could be neutral. You know, it was, it was different. <laughs> and I returned to my family. I met my son for the first time. I went to Valley Forge General Hospital, which was the closest hospital to my home of record. I was in and out of the hospital for four months in a casualty st status. I had several surgeries. I had malnutrition. I had dysentery. I was eaten up with parasites. I had malaria. I had all the stuff. But 
I got out and I went back to duty in August of 1973. I remained in the Army. I retired from the Reserve. I've had the most successful practice down in Florida, beyond my wildest dreams. I don't have PTSD. I've never had a nightmare or a flashback. I'm not defined by my captivity. Uh, it was a bump in the road of my life. And nobody gets through life without some tragedy. And I just feel lucky. I am remarkably lucky. That's what I am. I survived a non-survivable plane crash. I'm the only survivor of the POW camp who was captured before 1968. And I was captured December 67. And in the end, I think it comes down to luck and calories. I was so fortunate to survive when so many braver and stronger men did not. I've done medical missions all over the world. And I just feel so lucky that I was born an American. I could have been born in Rwanda. I mean, I could have been. And I love my country more than anything. And I'm really proud and honored that I could serve my country under very difficult circumstances. And I can return and feel even more love and devotion to my country. I want to tell you this. I have to use these, but for a different reason. Uh, there were 12, I told you there were 12 survivors in our camp. Gail and I hosted a, re a reunion for us in Orlando in October of last year, 2017. Twelve survivors, three have died. It's been 45 years. That leaves nine. One guy was not invited. That leaves eight. One guy was sick and couldn't come. That leaves seven. And one guy's lost. We don't know where he is. I think he may be in Europe. That leaves six. Six guys, three white and three black. Some of them brought children and grandchildren. There were 16 of us in all. And we hosted this banquet in this fancy Orlando restaurant. And each man got up and spontaneously spoke of his love for the others and how we had all sustained each other and depended on each other and how none of us would have survived if it hadn't been for all of us. And in this day of terrible racial divisions, the identity politics of the age, I call it the disuniting of America, I wish the whole country could have seen our banquet. I really do. Shakespeare, as usual, has it right. You know, he has King Henry V say, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he that sheds his blood with me this day shall be my brother. And these men, three white, three black. We are brothers. There's no question about that. And Shakespeare knew about veterans, too. You know, he said, he who survives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and strip his sleeve and show his scars. I guess we have scars. We have physical scars, for sure, maybe mental scars. But in this final phase of my life, when I can stand a tiptoe and just see the finish barely over the horizon. I am just so fortunate that I was able to make a contribution and come safe home. So thank you very much. Sorry if I went up I don't, I don't know how to start. <laughs> That's the most amazing recitation of uh, story, Hal. Uh, I know we had a few questions from the audience. I'll just go to this, and no one signed this, but it said, how did you maintain your sanity during that captivity? What was it like on a day-to-day -day level? What kept you going? And at the bottom, fervently, thank you for your service. I wish I could answer that question. I don't know. And I had some, you know, the first couple of years when I was captured, I had some really down days. And then I think I saw purpose in helping to take care of my fellow prisoners. One fellow, uh, Julius Long of Pulaski, Virginia, suffered a cardiac arrest one day. 
and I was able to resuscitate him. He came home, uh, and I think I saw that I had a, a duty, but I really don't know. I mean, I thought of my family often. I thought of my children. Uh, I thought of my home, my country. I really never lost faith that my country would bring me home. And there was a certain point in my captivity when I actually felt in, invincible, that nothing would happen to me. I had this, that was wrong, I mean, but that's the way I felt. And uh, that, I don't, I, I can't answer the gentleman's question. And I think, as I said in my talk, it comes down to luck. I was lucky. I'm a lucky boy. Just, just a couple of questions, and um, you mentioned um, the, the enemy in, attempted to indoctrinate you. What about the visits to North Vietnam by the people that you mentioned, um, Shane Fonda, Ramsey, Ramsey Clark, Pete Seeger? Did you ever come in contact with them, or did you hear about those visits? What was the I just heard them over the camp radio. I see. I never came in contact. Uh, there were stories of uh, POW, POWs being forced to see them. There was, uh, and tortured, um, but I, I was never approached about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned linebacker two in 1972. This was bombing of Hanoi. How close did the bombing come to where you were being kept? Uh, uh, it, I never saw any damage to our compound, but very, very close by when I was riding around the truck to go to uh, the Hilton, the Hanoi was actually destroyed. I would say uh, 100 meters. It, it came that close? Yeah, it came close. Wow. came very close. You, you mentioned, um, we had dinner last night, and you mentioned that you saw a uh, hospital that had been hit. You, you tell that? Because I thought this was very telling. Well, this was after the war ended, after the peace was signed and we were waiting to go home. They took me, and I was the only one, and they took me uh, in the environs of Hanoi to show me that a hospital that was bombed out, that Americans had bombed this hospital, and the operating room was in smithereens, and you could tell it was an operating room. But, and you know, I, right next to the hospital was a SAM site, and surely, I mean, they put the SAM sites next to the hospitals hoping they wouldn't be bombed. I mean, and they were. So that, that's the story. The, the folks that were in your group that were released, I mean, you mentioned last night that um, John McCain was in your group. Who else was Everett Alvarez or any of the others? No, Alvarez came home. He was in the first group. You know, he was captured in um, August of 64. Yeah. And they say he was the longest held POW, but he was not. Who was in my group was Floyd J. Jim Thompson, who was the longest held American prisoner in American history. He was captured in March of 1964. Special Forces cap, uh, captain captured in the South. There is uh, a very tragic book by Tom Philpot about Jim Thompson. He was captured nine years and six months and something like that. And when he came home, his wife had actually uh, lived with someone else and had several children. I was in Africa on a medical mission coming back from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I was in the Amsterdam airport, this was 2006, and I was watching TV waiting for my flight and it announced that Jim Thompson had died. And I know he died of alcoholism, he had cirrhosis of the liver. He used to come up to my house, he lived in Key West, and he just could never get past his captivity. Um, and he, uh, it was just a very tragic story. There, just, just a tragic, this, the horrors of war. Thanks. Have you ever been back to Vietnam since? I have not been back, and someone else asked me that today, and um, I have no desire to go back. Some of my friends have gone back multiple times. I would go back if somebody paid my way. I was kind of interested, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't go if I had to pay myself. <laughs> I feel the same way. <clears throat> I've never been back. Um, question here, did you meet the NVA soldier or, or author while making the Ken Burns documentary? And you remember when they made the documentary? Yeah, no, I did not. I didn't meet anyone. It, uh, 
uh, my filming was an uh, interesting story in itself, and I told someone else about it, but um, it was nine and a half hours of straight filming, except for a 30 minute break where I made them a peanut butter sandwich in my house. <laughs> and uh, there were a crew of five or six, sound, lighting, camera, uh, some guy moved the furniture, another guy put screens on the windows, there was makeup. Um, and I, they were the only people I met. And then that was done in 2011, I believe. And then in 2015, we saw a screening. We were invited to go to New York City. And we saw a screening. It was a rough cut. They had date time stamps on the film, and it was not very good fidelity or anything. Uh, and we saw it over four days. There were a number of other people who were in the film then, but not the full complement. There were about maybe 12 or 15 people, and a lot of other people who did the music, and the PBS people, and the big donors, people like that. But no, I, I didn't. How were you selected for the Ken Burns documentary? Um, Phil and I have a mutual friend named Joe Galloway, who's a very well-known war correspondent and author, and a great speaker. I'm sure he, he's spoken here twice. In fact, uh, when I walked in my room, 406, his picture was the first one I saw on the wall. I took a picture of it and I sent it to him by text. And I said, look, look whose mug I see when I first walk into my room. And he wrote me back and he said, I am everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, that's true. <laughs> so, uh, Joe uh, was a consultant on that film. And Joe recommended, he knew my story, he stayed in my house several times, he, he recommended that Lynn Novick contact me. She called me, uh, we talked on the phone, then she came down to Daytona Beach, she flew down there and she spent a couple of days in our house and we auditioned each other. I really like her, she's a very wonderful person. We see the world quite differently, but I, I like her, she's just a charming person. So. Uh, she recruited me, and I, I, that's how it came to be. You know, during the filming of that documentary, you said that you met many of the others who were principals that actually showed in the documentary on the other side, people who had different attitudes toward the war. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. Yeah, so, um, I didn't see any of the film, and none of it, not even my part, until November of 2015, when we went to the, I think it's WNET in New York in these studios, and we watched the film in rough cut four days, and it was, it was brutal, grim. I mean, they fed us breakfast in the studio, they fed us lunch in the studio, and we, it was like a 12-hour day, and we watched it in segments and we critiqued it, and I don't know why we critiqued it, because Ken Burns said that the film was already locked, you know what that means, it was done, so nothing was gonna change, but in that, we commented on the film, and I met um, several people, General McPeak, Tony McPeak, who was a four-star Air Force general, and I think he was an F-105 pilot in Vietnam, and he became Air Force Chief of Staff, and I met uh, Carl Marlantis, who has spoken here, and who's a wonderful guy, and I met this guy named Bob Zimmerman, who's just a communist. He was a, a organizer of anti-war demonstrations, and Tim, what's Tim's last name? Tim O'Neill, Tim O? Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien, I met Tim O'Brien, who I didn't like much. <laughs> uh, found him very arrogant. Anyway, I almost got in a fist fight with Tim O'Brien and Bob Zimmerman, General McPeak uh, settled us down. So there were a lot of divergent opinions. And you know, I don't, that's not the way I see the world, but I understand that's part of the story. That's part of the Vietnam story, a big part, the division that it caused the United States and the people who were part of that division. And so I think that needed to be told too. If you're gonna say, tell the history of Vietnam, that's part of it. But you know, the kids today know nothing about it. I mean, I see kids in my practice all the time and we, I talk to them and we talk about American history in general. I mean, they don't know anything about it. American history, and the Vietnam War is as remote as the War of Jenkins' Ear or the War of 1812. Phil and I are the only two people in the room that know about the War of Jenkins' Ear. Damn right. Um, <laughs> Got to say something. Uh, when I first, I didn't know how 
until I saw him on the documentary and I thought, that guy's from Virginia. And not only from Virginia, he's from the Valley. And uh, you pronounce Pulaski, Virginia. Yeah. You know, you'd look at it and think it's Pulaski, but not in Virginia, it's not. <laughs> Virginia's got the damnedest jargon. I mean, you- They have several different regional accents they in Virginia. Do. It's really something. <laughs> um, different. Here's one that says, um, have you told your children about your POW experiences? Oh yes, my children know about it. My daughter particularly, because she remembered me before I was captured. Mm. My son, he, he's, uh, we haven't s sat down and talked about Vietnam, no, but it's come up. My son knows that I was captured. And we did one of those events with Lynn Novick like you did. Yeah. And he came to that, it was in Orlando where he lives. But one thing, you know, just you and I have talked about this. And one thing about Lynn Novick, who's a producer for Ken Burns, and what I was impressed with, when, and I think they did the same thing, is no one that showed up in that documentary didn't go through the, the strongest diligence to make sure that you were who you said you were. You, w you were where you said you were and when you were there. They actually went out and found the radio logs of my battalion on the day that we found the mass graves at Hoi. And I thought, I never knew those radio logs still existed. And, and they were very careful about screening people that showed up in this because they wanted to make sure that nobody slipped in with any stories that couldn't have been born in. So yeah. here's one from, what did you think of Jane Fonda? I didn't write this. I have a practice response to that. I've been asked that many times. So, the, you know, we all have set pieces. And I, I think to be an ardent feminist, um, I, she's always taken the persona of the man she was married to. When she was uh, married to Roger Vadim, you know, she was a sex kitten. And when she was married to Tom Hayden, she was a radical. And when she was married to uh, Ted Turner, she was just a rich guy's wife, rode around in a Rolls Royce and so forth. Now I understand she's found Jesus and is born again and so forth. But I think basically and succinctly, she used to be a sex object and then she became an object of derision. I said that in the film, but they edited it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Okay, this says last question. Um, this is from an Air Force nurse stationed at Travis. Uh, what an extraordinary experience. Thank you for visiting and shaping your experiences with us. You touched my heart. Do you have any triggers? How do you feel now about nurses after your rifle rod heating treatment through your shoulder? <laughs> That's a damnedest question. You know, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I love nurses. I work with nurses. I had a scrub tech that is not a registered nurse, but she was an operating technician that worked with me for 25 years. I took her all over the world, Africa, India, everything. I had, I had 20 nurses that work in my office, and I, have, I harbor no ill feel, feelings against any nurse because that one nurse cauterized my wound I have no ill feeling about a girl I play tennis with who is part Japanese because the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. You know, I have no ill feeling about that. And I was a, I'm a Pearl Harbor survivor. Yes, you are. So, um, so no, I, I love nurses. It used to be when you were, it, as a young doctor, you'd go up to the nurse's station, they would all stand up when they had the caps on and you know, they put the charts in the rack and you want to make rounds. Now you go up to the nurse's station and they just keep typing on the computer. <laughs> Nobody looks it is, that's disgusting. <laughs> uh, that was the last question. I think the folks want to get to know you, so thank you very much. Can I drink now? That's it. <laughs> In ending our program tonight, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but late last year, President Trump signed into law a, a, a bill that recognizes all of you as Vietnam veterans. And I'm going to ask General Hewley to come up here and uh, present the lapel pin. You will be honored with your own day, March 29th. And this pin that he's handing out now commemorates that. I just want to say that it's just hard for, I think, anybody in this room to really fathom your story. And I can't thank you enough, but I want to do it on behalf of the club, on behalf of General Hewley, General Myatt, who was here before him, 
You do us a great honor by coming here. We know you don't tell your story often. We know that. And we feel very privileged. And thank you. And Mr. Gioia, we thank you very much for your participation in this. And I'd like to end it right now with a big round of applause for these two fantastic guys.